Good evening, everybody. Everybody got a handout? Yes? From the tables over there? Okay. Well, it is good to be back together. I feel like it was spring break, and then last week we were all together for some uh, gospel conversation training that was really good and really helpful. Uh, but I've missed you guys, and I've missed being able to go through our study together, so I'm excited to be back uh, and, and get cranking here. But before we jump in, uh, since I have the microphone and I think I can get it out before anybody could stop me, um, I'm going to take a minute and make a little plug for our men's retreat coming up on April 14th through the 16th, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it's in Spicewood, Texas at Highland Lakes uh, Camp, and it is going to be really good. And so, men, uh, you still got a few more days to get signed up before registration closes, just under a week. And man, I would love for you to be able to go. It is just a great time for um, guys that maybe don't normally get to cross paths and rub shoulders to be able to do that. There's great, like just relationships that are formed, friendships that are made, a lot of fun that's had. It's a great chance to get to know people. Pastor Jason and I are going to be doing the teaching during the large group sessions. Uh, Pastor Mark and Will Haynes are going to be leading worship for the sessions. Um, it's a new venue for us. There's a lot of activities to do during the day on, on Saturday in the afternoon for free time. The food's going to be delicious. It's just going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so please, please, please get signed up. You can go to the website to do it. Um, you could see either Ron Smith or Dan Ball and they can get you signed up. Uh, they can help you get connected there. Uh, and also we, we've got some scholarships available if that's needed as well. Okay. If that, I don't want that to ever be a reason somebody couldn't go. So, um, just please, please get signed up. It's just be a wonderful time. I hope you could go and join us. Okay. So commercial over, but but, uh, but I wanted to make it. All right. So that was just a freebie there. And we won't put that on YouTube on the video for, um, for the people who watch this. So they'll just, you know, we'll cut that part out. All right. Oh, they, need to hear it too. they need to hear it too. All right, fine. <laughs> By the time they hear it, the signups may be over. So tell him. Yeah. And you can bring guests. There you go. Right. It's not just for church members, right? You can bring friends and we encourage you to, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, um, I enjoyed it last year. We had a great time. So, so there we go. I love it. Okay. Well, let's pray and we're going to jump in tonight and get started. I am battling. I don't know what, um, I thought I had survived all the different Texas 12 Texas allergy seasons, one for every month. I thought I had got through all, all 12 of them, but there's one apparently that uh, doesn't like me. And that's this month, whatever this month's, you know, allergy is that's thank it's Oak. Okay. Well, Oak doesn't, is not my friend. And, um, so, um, let's pray and Matt ball, would you pray for us tonight and just spare my voice for a few minutes and then I'll <laughs> take it from there. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And Matt's prayer uh, is actually, I was, it struck me today as I was kind of looking back through notes and what we were going to cover, that that is exactly what my prayer is as a result of coming out of this study that we're doing, looking at these threads that just 
move through all of scripture, that it really would uh, do a couple of things. One, just ignite a passion in you for the word of God, to see it come alive, to see just how intentional the story that God is telling from Genesis to Revelation is, how cohesive it is. Um, how purposeful it is uh, and that it would just make you long to be in his word uh, because the, when we are in his word, his word changes us. Amen. And so that is, that is my goal for this. I know that's pastor Jason and I were having this discussion today that that would be a result of this study together, that the word of God would just become that for us. Um, and also that the word of God, as we learn how to read our Bibles, you've heard pastor Jason say that several evenings when we've been together is that looking at the word of God in this way, chasing these threads, these types through scripture teaches you how to read your Bible. Right. And that, that's one of the things I think we're learning through this. But it also does something. It helps you be able to spot false teaching. Right. When people just pull a passage of scripture out of the Bible and try to take it down some crazy trail. Right. By looking at it the way we're looking at it, you're seeing what God is doing, this unfolding plan of redemption that we see all through scripture that points to Jesus. And so as you see that, it helps you be able to, if you hear things, right, if you read something, right, we live in a world where information just comes at us faster than we can process it. But as you read it, as you hear it, as you listen to people talk, if you know what scripture is doing and you know what God is doing and what he's unfolding, when you hear something that doesn't line up with that, right, you're going to be able to spot it, right? And it's not going to trip you up, right? Or you might be able to help it not trip somebody else up. So I think it's going to help give us some really good guardrails as we study the word of God to be faithful uh, to interpreting it correctly, because we can't, in, we can't apply it correctly if we don't interpret it correctly, Right. And so that's, those are some of the real hopes, big picture of what we're doing, right? We're not just coming away saying, man, we are great students of the Bible and let's pat ourselves on the back that we, that we know how to read the Bible, right? No, it, it, it needs to get much more practical than that. And so those are two of the ways that I think it gets really practical. Tonight is, I'm really excited uh, to look at our, our thread tonight, and that is the one of profit. OK, we've come to one that I think you're going to see how this starts to pull in some of the things we've already been talking about. We're going to start connecting some things tonight that you're going to be like, oh, we've, I, I remember us talking about that. And I see now how that fits into what we're doing tonight. I think this is going to be really exciting. Um, it's kind of like when you, you know, when you when you're I'm trying to think of um, of a. I'll use guitar playing, okay, um, for, that may not resonate with too many people, but it might with a few, right? When you first start taking guitar lessons, right, you start learning, you know, the names of the strings and then, you know, and that didn't really do much. And then you learn how to pluck a string and get a little bit of a tone out of it. And that's, that's okay, right? And then you start trying to make a chord and it sounds awful because you're not pressing everything right. And you're touching strings you shouldn't be touching, you know, but you keep trying and you learn how to make one chord and it sounds great and you're so proud. Well, well, then you have to learn how to make another chord, right? And you learn four or five of those. And then you have to learn how to change between them while you continue to strum with the other hand. And it's just, it's like you're learning all these skills, right? All these little techniques and tools. And for a long time, it's like, I don't see any progress. But then at some point it clicks, right? All the practice, all the work finally clicks and you can actually play a song, right? And it's like, Finally, it makes sense, right? That's kind of what I hope happens, starts happening tonight is we've been, we've been building this little box of tools that we really don't know what in the world we're doing with it. But tonight it's going to be like, oh, I, I can see some of these things coming together. So hopefully that's a bad analogy maybe or illustration, but it makes sense in my mind. So hopefully it'll, it'll help you tonight. Okay. Profit definition of profit. Let's start there. Just kind of a general understanding of what a profit is. If I ask you that, right, even if don't cheat and look at what I wrote down there for you, but um, what would you have said um, before, before you looked, uh, if I said, what's a profit, what would you, what would you say a profit is? Anybody? Someone who speaks for God. That's good. A future has an element of telling the future. Okay. Somebody that brings warnings. Okay, good. 
All those things are, are part of what a prophet is, right? And that fits in with what we've, what we've got right here. A prophet is basically, it's a person used by God to communicate his message to other people. Right, that's, a, that's about as simple as I can, I can define what a prophet is. A prophet, though, has a couple of roles. I think for a lot of us, when we first think of a prophet, we think of someone who tells the future. But when we look at what the prophets in Scripture are doing, that is such a small part of their role. Um, there is an element of that where God tells them, here is something that's going to happen in the future, and I want you to declare that. That is part of the role of a prophet. But many times, the role of a prophet is God just telling them, I have a message. I want a certain group of people to hear, and I need you to go preach or teach that. Right? So a lot of what a prophet does practically, he's a preacher, right? I have the word teacher there. I kind of wish I had changed that and, and put the word preacher because I think that is a lot of times that's the function practically of what a prophet would do to take a message from God and deliver it to a people. Um, he would speak, right? Somebody said this. He would speak for God to people. We see that many, many times of a prophet. But there's an element where we see prophets speaking to God on behalf of people, right? Going to God on behalf of the, of the people that he was supposed to go to. It's almost like a little bit of a, a back and forth, right? God says, I want you to go to, to this people and I want you to tell them this. And he goes to this and then he looks at this people and he says, I got to go tell God something about these people. And he goes back to God and says, this people, you know, I mean, so we'll see that kind of come out. But that's the role of a prophet too. So those are, that's just a general understanding of a prophet that we need to just have in our, in our minds as we start to go through and chase this thread a little bit tonight, okay? A couple of prophets that maybe you wouldn't think uh, would be a prophet, but when we think about it based on this definition, there's a couple of people right at the very beginning of Scripture that functioned in the role of a prophet. I've got Adam down there. How would Adam have functioned as a prophet, right? If I were to ask you to name a prophet in Scripture if you hadn't had this sheet in front of you, I don't know that you would have raised your hand and said, Adam was a prophet in the Bible, would you? No, we would have picked Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, right? We, might have, we would have picked somebody like that. But Adam served a, in a role of a prophet based on what a prophet really does. Look at, look at this. In Genesis uh, chapter 2 and verse 16, God commanded the man telling him from any tree of the garden you can eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Remember that? It was to who? The man. But then in Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent is talking to Eve, what does Eve tell the serpent? What she heard from Adam. What she heard, yeah. The, the, what God told Adam. How did Eve find out? From Adam, right? Adam took a message that God had given him and he delivers it to Eve. So in that way, Adam is functioning as a prophet. She heard it from Adam. How about Noah? Did Noah receive a message from God to, to build an ark? But he also, why, why did God tell him to build the ark? Because there's a flood coming that he was going to destroy the world, right? And so Noah goes about this project, right? This hundred year project to build this ark during that time. Do we have any clue about what Noah was doing? Yeah. Um, second Peter, Peter calls him a preacher of righteousness, right? I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of, uh, <clears throat> doesn't take a whole lot to understand what would that message that Noah would have been preaching while he and his sons are building this ark, right? It would be repent, right? God's going to destroy the earth with the flood because of the wickedness of mankind. And only those who get into the ark will be saved. So you need to repent. You need to get on the ark. So Noah serves a prophetic role in scripture. But the first person um, we're going to see in just a minute that actually is called a prophet in scripture is Abraham. Okay. But before we start looking at Abraham for just a minute, I want, we gave a general understanding of a prophet, but I want to take you to a passage in numbers chapter 12. And I want you to see 
what God says about a prophet. He's addressing Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, and Miriam, Moses' sister, when they're speaking against Moses. They're angry with Moses. They don't like what, what's happening. And so they're speaking against Moses. And look at what God says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. He said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision, and I shall speak with him in a dream. So there's a little bit more of a focused description by God of what a prophet, of how God relates and talks to a prophet. Right? We see that God would communicate with the prophet in, in visions and, and in dreams to, to communicate the message that he would want the prophet to, to deliver. And so keep that in your mind too. We're building some things because we're going to see them unfold in just a minute. But Abraham, think about the story, what you know about Abraham, because the first person in Scripture that's called a prophet is Abraham, and it happens in Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Right, this is where Abraham uh, is a little bit of afraid because his wife is really pretty, right? And he's gone uh, to a foreign land with a king who thinks his wife is really pretty. And Abraham thinks Elimelech or Abimelech is actually going to kill him so that he can have his wife. And so Abraham devises this plot to save his own neck to say, hey, just tell her, just tell the king, you're my sister. Right? That, that's the plan that Abraham and, and Sarah work out, or Abraham works it out and you know, Sarah has to go along with it. That's, I don't think Sarah was probably real happy with the plan if I'm, if I'm just speculating, right? But God warns Abimelech, like, don't touch Sarah, <clears throat> right? But look at what he says in, in chapter 20 of Genesis verse 7. Now, therefore, this is God talking to Abimelech. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abraham's called a prophet. Now think about what we've talked about so far, right? That a prophet is one who communicates a message from God. He hears from God. He speaks for God to, to other people. God communicates with a prophet through visions, through dreams, right? Take all those things that we've looked at so far and think with me about the narrative and the storyline of Abraham. How, what are just quick examples of how Abraham functioned as a prophet? Like ways that we would see that. Yeah, God, I mean, God communicated with him, right, to tell him that all the nations of the world will be blessed through, through you, right, that I am going to give you a son, right? There's even a little bit of a future prediction there, like, hey, in this, in this time, right, I'm going to visit you again on this, at this time, and when I do, this is going to happen to you, right? Abraham is being told what will happen in the future, Right? Abraham is, is getting visions from the Lord. God is showing him things. He says, go out into the night and look up at the stars. Right? And if you could number the stars, that's the number of your descendants. Right? I'm going to bless the world. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you. Right? I've given you a list of several things there that, that show that Abraham would have been part of that thread, that, that, that picture of, of a prophet in, in his day. Right? But we could go on with that and look at his, <clears throat> the people that we would include with Abraham as the patriarchs, Isaac and Jacob. Right? We've already seen several times throughout our study that when there's these repeated patterns that we see where there's these, this happened to this person and the exact same thing happened to this person and then we see it again with this person, God's wanting you to see something. He's wanting you to connect those things together. There's a lot of parallels in the story of Abraham and Isaac and in, and in some ways even with Jacob. And as we see that, right, we don't have time to go into all the ways that we see these links, right? But there are some, right? Abraham lies about his wife to save his neck. Isaac lies about his wife to save his neck, right? Isaac meets his his wife, uh, his wife is met by Abraham's servant at a well. Jacob meets his wife at a well, right? There's all these little just clues as we read this narrative that links these people together. But when you look even at a couple of passages, Genesis 26 and Genesis 28, we see God communicating with Isaac, reminding him of the covenant that he's made with Abraham. And then we see him do it again with Jacob. Right, and so even Isaac, we're seeing this, this flow go. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all serving in, in this, this way of, of, of like a prophet. 
right? There, there's that element to, to their life and to their story that we see in the early part all through Genesis. But then we come to Exodus, and we're introduced to another character in Scripture, and that's Moses, right? We could even say Joseph. We're not going to take time to look at Joseph, but we could even look at Joseph and say Joseph had a prophetic role, right, in his family, with his brothers, even in, in Egypt. So, but we move past Joseph, and Moses comes onto the scene. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Lord your God, verse 15, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. That's Moses talking. Moses tells the people, listen, the Lord is going to raise up for you a prophet like me. Right, so now we're getting a little bit more specific, right? It's not just general, a prophet who communicates a message for God, um, speaks on God's behalf, tells them about something that's going to happen, gives them a warning. No, Moses says, listen, God's going to do something. He's going to raise up someone, future, right? It's pointing to the future. At some point, God's going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among your countrymen. And what does he say? It's best that they do. He gives them some really good advice. You should listen to him. This is a major, and we need to understand this. This is a major thread, major movement in Scripture that we've got to understand if we're going to understand the point of Scripture. Moses addressing the people before they go into the promised land here in Deuteronomy saying, listen, my time is up. Right? I've served the Lord. I've served you. I've done what God has called me to do. My time is passing, but there is coming another prophet like me who, has ser- who will serve, who will lead, who will do similar things to what I have done. And you, p- this people, you need to listen to him. Right? That needs to get our attention, right? is that there is coming one that's going to be in this thread, in this type of Moses. It's going to be really significant. We could expand that numbers passage that we already looked at, right, where we got the definition of a prophet, um, that God would make himself known in visions and in dreams. But look at how that continues starting in verse 7. It says, not so with my servant Moses. This shows how he's different from some of the other prophets we would see in Scripture. With my servant Moses, what does he say? He is faithful in all my household, and with him He doesn't speak in visions and dreams. What does he say? Directly, mouth to mouth, right? Even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the forms of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses, right? That was was addressing Miriam and Aaron, like, you guys better better back down, right? You're talking talking bad against my servant Moses, right? Because he's a prophet unlike any other prophet, right? I speak to him face to face, right? And so we're seeing something very unique about how Moses functions in the Old Testament here. And we see it even more at the end of Deuteronomy when we get to chapter 34 as the book is closing. Look at verse 10. Since that time, no one, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. You see how Moses is kind of set apart here as a very unique figure in the Old Testament? Right? This language of Scripture is meant for you to say, I wonder what's so different about Moses. Why is he this prophet unlike any other prophet? Why is he one that would say there's not been a prophet that's ever arisen like Moses? We're going to look at that for just a couple of minutes, but part of what what. What Deuteronomy is trying to show us is that from this point forward with Moses, Israel was going to be looking for that prophet who would come in this spirit of Moses, right? Who would lead and who would who would who would do the things that they saw Moses do, right? And so there's this anticipation that Deuteronomy leaves us with, right? As Israel is about to enter the promised land, right? They've been they've come out of Egypt, they've been delivered from slavery in in in, in Egypt, they've come through their wilderness wanderings, and now they're about to take the promised land. Moses is 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 exiting the scene, and he says, 
I may be done, but God's not done. There's going to be another prophet who's going to come after me. But before we move on, I think we need to see what makes Moses unique, his, his unique role as a prophet. There's, there's four things that I've got some scriptures here that I want you to maybe be able to go back and look at a little bit later. But, but Moses' role as a prophet, he functioned as God used him as a deliverer. Did he not? To deliver the people out of Egypt? Now, whose hand delivered Israel from their slavery in Egypt? God did it, right? I mean, we see that in, in Exodus 3. God says, I will deliver you, right? And, and if we were to go to Exodus 6, God, God, the I am statements, right? God says, I am the one who brought you out of your slavery. I am the one who redeemed you, right? It's evident. This is God doing the work. But does God use people to, to accomplish the things that he wants to accomplish? Absolutely. So did God use Moses to be a deliverer for his people? Yeah, Moses functioned, his prophetic role within his people. Part of that was he was a deliverer. He was also a mediator, right? He was that person who stood between two parties, right? We see that all through the wilderness wanderings, don't we? And even before in Egypt where, God go, where Moses goes to God on behalf of this stiff-necked, stubborn people who so quickly forgot the good things that God had done for them. And we see Moses going to God. God, don't wipe them out, right? Give them another chance, right? We also see there are times where Moses wants to, God, never mind, forget what I said, you know, uh, just go ahead, just be done with them, right? But we see Moses functioning in this, this role of a, of a mediator of the covenant where he is, is trying to bring two parties together, right? This covenant people, God's chosen people that he is going to use to make his name known and to bless all of the world. We see Moses in this role to try to, 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 to be that bridge, to bring that together. So we see him in that role. We see him in the role of a priest, right? Serving in this role of a priest. And it even, Psalm 99 even speaks to that, right? The psalmist looking back at the history of, of Israel, he looks back and he says, Moses and Aaron, Right? It wasn't just Aaron that was a priest. He's looking back saying, well, Moses, Moses was a priest for his people right? to go to God on their behalf. But he was also a ruler. Right? He ruled the people. They didn't have a king. Right? God was to be their king. The covenant that he established, right? it had this language that made you think of, of this relationship of he was going to be the groom and they were going to be his bride. They were going to be his people. He was going to lead them. Right? But he used Moses to be his mouthpiece, to lead the people. And even when they're still in Egypt, right? when he's in Egypt, before he has to flee, when he murders an Egyptian who's mistreating one of the Hebrews, what does, that, what does the Hebrew say to him when he come, Moses comes out a little bit later after he's done this and the, that get, Moses tries to break up a fight among a couple of Hebrews and that guy says, what are you going to do, right? You're going to kill me too? But he also says to him there, he says, are you a ruler and a judge over us? Are you a prince among us, right? It's said in a mocking way, like, who are you, Moses? But there's some truth in it, isn't there? Moses really did serve in this role of a leader, of a, of a ruler, who would be serving his people. So Moses sets the standard. That's what we need to remember about Moses as we move forward. He sets the standard by which all the other prophets who would come after him would be evaluated. Right? Every prophet that followed Moses, you can almost, I mean, think about it. If you're, if you're a Hebrew, right, and you, you know that Moses, right, you've read, you've read the first five books of the Bible, right? You, you understand that Moses is this prophetic figure, that there's going to come one like him in the future. And every prophet that comes on the scene, you're thinking, is this the one, right? Is he the one that's going to do the things that Moses did, right? Is he the one who's going to deliver us again from the trouble we've gotten ourselves into? They lean in. Every prophet is going to be evaluated and measured based upon Moses as the standard from this point forward. But there's another thread that we need to see, right? The big movement that we needed to understand is a prophet like Moses, understanding that phrase. But there's another thing, starting now here on page 78, there's another thing we're going to chase for a few minutes here. And you're, just stay with me. It's all going to make sense as we go along. But it's this idea of 
prophets who show up in pairs. Okay? Moses is the first in a pair of prophets that that scripture shows us. And there's going to be two more that we're going to see. These are meant to be seen together. There's a, there, the scripture wants you to connect this pair and to connect this pair and then to connect this pair, but then to connect all three pairs. Right? There, there, it's, it's this movement that takes you all the way through the Bible. So the first pair starts with Moses. We've already looked at him. But who followed Moses as the leader of the people? Joshua followed Moses. Look at the language in Numbers 27, right, as we see Moses' time coming to an end. Who's going to lead the people? Look at verse 16. Appoint a man over the congregation so that they will not, verse 17, be like sheep which have no shepherd. Then verse 18, God says, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him. Verse 23, so Moses lays his hands on him and commissions him just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. So now you have Moses who served in this role. He's stepping away. Joshua is stepping forward to to take the baton, to lead them into the promised land. It is amazing the parallel between what we see Moses doing and what we see Joshua doing, right? When you look at how Scripture connects them by the things they do and the things they say, you can't not see that Scripture wants you to connect them, to say, oh, I meant to show that these go together, right? Look, standing on holy ground, remember Moses at the burning bush? Joshua has a burning bush type experience where he's told to remove his sandals because he's on holy ground, right? We see Moses interceding for Israel. Joshua's doing it. Moses executing justice. Joshua does it. Moses delivering warnings and reminders, telling them to stay away from idolatry, telling them that they're never going to be able to keep the law if they don't rely on God and his strength, right? Joshua has to tell them the same thing. Remember in Joshua chapter 1, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth, right? We see even in the way they approach writing of the word of God, the same language is used with Moses and it's used with Joshua. And then think about the crossing of the waters, Right? The language that's used, even in Joshua 4.23, it actually connects it for us. Right? We don't even have to do the work of saying, oh yeah, Moses crossed the Red Sea coming out of Egypt on dry ground, but then Joshua crosses the Jordan River on dry ground to go in and take the promise. Like, hmm, I wonder if God's trying to connect that. No, we don't even have to do that. Because God does it for us in Joshua 4.23. It shows that relationship as well. That we're meant to see the ministry of Moses and the ministry of Joshua complemented each other. They work together. The the parallels in those ministries, we were meant to understand them in, in connection with each other. Okay? So let's set Moses and Joshua aside for just a few minutes. Let's pick up another pair of prophets. All right? This one, when you're the guy up here talking and you have to talk about both of these at the same time, your tongue gets all twisted, okay? So just bear with me. Um, If I say the wrong one, when you're looking at it, go, you meant to say that one. Yeah, I probably did, and I just got confused, okay? But Elijah and Elisha, not just their names being similar is why we should connect them together, but it's what we see in their ministry. Just like you had Moses and Joshua followed, you had Elijah, and then Elisha directly followed him in their ministry among among the Jewish people. And so, look here, their ministry shows up between the chapters of 1 Kings chapter 17 and 2 Kings chapter 7 is where we see the bulk of their ministry going on in the Old Testament. And I went ahead and gave you a chart here so you could go back and look at these. But... In that section, it lists the mighty works that God performed through these two prophets. Look at the column there on your, on your left. Look at the ones under Elijah. Somebody that's already done it. How many things do we see there that Elijah did? Ten. All right. Somebody, I knew somebody would have already counted. <laughs> you, were, you were totaling them up. Right? So we see ten that Elijah did. Now, one interesting thing you can do, you can look over here under Elijah and see that most of these things that Elijah did, Elisha did as well later on, 
right? Very similar connection. So that's a parallel that we need to see that, of, of that importance. But what's something very noticeable about this chart? All right. Yeah, you guys are smart, right? Uh, yeah. Elisha did way more. In fact, he did twice as much as Elijah did. We have 10 things, these mighty works, miracles, if you will, that, a lot, that God performed through Elijah. We have 22, I counted them for you, that Elisha did. Why do you think that is? Not necessarily. I don't even know the answer to that. That's a good question. I need to look that up. I don't even know if it tells us their ages. He had a double. He asked for, right? Second Kings chapter two. I didn't write this down for you because I didn't want to give it away because I knew you'd look ahead. So just write down in the margin there of your paper. Second Kings chapter two, verses eight through fifteen. This point in scripture. These verses are where. Elijah is about to leave the scene, and he's handing the mantle to Elisha. And Elisha is not real happy about it. He doesn't really want, you know, Elijah to, to ride off into the sunset or ride up to heaven, if you will, right, in, <laughs> in a chariot. <coughs> Excuse me. So he begs, he begs um, Elijah or Elisha begs Elijah to take him with him. Like, let me keep going with you. He's like, no, you stay here. I've got to go on. God's done with me. You're the man. He's like, no, 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 take me with you. Take me with you. And so like three times they have to go through this whole little, this whole little encounter. But finally, Elisha, you can almost just see the scene. He begs, okay, fine, if you must go, right? If, you, if God's taking you away from me and now I've got to carry on with this ministry, he's like, at least would you just give me a double portion of your spirit, right? I want to be, I want to have a double portion of your spirit if I'm going to be able to even like do the things that God used you to do. Look at how God answers that prayer. Like even scripture gives us, even in, even in the details, right? God blesses Elisha with a double portion of that spirit of Elijah. And we even have recorded for us like twice as many, more than twice as many things that we see Elijah doing than or Elisha doing than, than Elijah. Right? Isn't scripture just so good? Isn't it so rich? Right? We're not just told, oh yeah, Elisha asked for a double portion and God granted it. No, scripture even shows us. Now look at it. Look at all the things. Look at all these other things that Elisha was used by God to do. So we see that. But now let's think about what we're doing here. We had this pair with Moses and Joshua. Now we've got this pair with, with Elijah and Elisha. But I want you to see something here. Um, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 8 says, Elijah took his mantle. This is at this transition of power. He took this mantle and he folded it together and he struck the waters and they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now, if I just read you the waters were struck, and they were divided here and there, and the two walked over on dry ground. What, where do you think we would be in Scripture when we're talking about waters parting and people walking across on dry ground? Yeah, you would think we're at the Red Sea, or even if we're not at the Red Sea, maybe we're at the Jordan River at the time of coming out of the wilderness wanderings and going into Jericho to, to take the promised land, right? That's where you would think we were, but that's not where we are. This is this time with Elijah stepping away and Elijah rising up to, to lead and, and to be the prophet uh, among the people for the Lord. But this language is meant to make you think back to Moses and to Joshua and that exchange from one to the other. So the, even the author of Kings is trying to get our attention and say, think back to Moses and Joshua, right? You're meant to see Elijah and Elisha as just that thread of the prophet and what God is doing among his people. So just think, I've, I've listed three similarities here that I want you, that shows this connection that shows these pairs, right? The first one is that the ministry is continued from the first prophet to the second prophet, 
right? There's a continuation of the ministry. It's not separate things where it's like, well, this prophet was all about this, and this was his, this was his soapbox, and this was his ax to grind. But now this prophet, he had a completely different vision and mission and, and idea, and he's over here just doing this. No, we see this flow, this continuation, right? Moses has led the people up to the edge of the promised land. Joshua continues. He takes them into the promised land. There's a continuation of the ministry. Same thing with Elijah and Elisha as they're fighting the prophets of Baal and the wicked queen Jezebel and Ahab. And you've got the Syrians and you've got all these enemies, right? Elijah has been standing in the gap for the people. Well, now Elisha is going to do the exact same thing, right? So we see that. But not only do they continue the ministry, we see in both accounts with the Moses and Joshua pair and with the Elijah and Elisha pair, they expand it. Think about that for a moment. We think of Moses, right? Even Deuteronomy tells us, a prophet like Moses. We think, well, it must not get any better than Moses. But we actually see Joshua expanding the ministry of Moses, right? Moses didn't take him into the promised land. Who did? Joshua, right? So, so we, we see this. We see Joshua leading, leading the charge to conquer the enemies in, in Cana so that they could take the land. Same thing with Elijah and Elisha, right? We see Elijah fighting the, pro the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, right? And just a little teaser, if you're going to Israel with me, we're actually going to stand there in just a few months, and we're going to get to look out and see it. But uh, just a little teaser, there's still spots you can sign up. Um, but anyway, we, we can see... Elijah fighting this battle against the wicked Queen Jezebel and her prophets of Baal, this false wicked God, right? And he, and he has victories. But guess what? When Elijah is taken to heaven, guess who's still alive? Jezebel and Ahab. And, and the worship of Baal is still alive and well. Guess who God uses to actually bring Jezebel to a very gruesome end as along with Ahab and all his 70 sons, Elisha, right? So we see the ministry not just continue, but expand with Elijah and Elisha. And then we have this, this pattern that we see that we've already talked about, this crossing of the water, right? With Moses, it's crossing the Red Sea. With Joshua, it's crossing the Jordan to go in. With Elijah and Elisha, we see both of them crossing over the Jordan on dry ground. So all of these similarities are meant to attach those two pairs to each other, but then to attach the four together to see there's something God's trying to tell us about these prophets. And there's a thread we're meant to chase. Got to keep going here. So let's think now, let's start moving forward with, with, with the Elijah and Elisha. We're going to see them now for just a little bit here. This idea of Elijah and the day of the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 37, very important verse. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Right? This is Elijah, right, and the Lord. This is, this is, this is an interaction here. But look at how Malachi, years later, Many years later, look at what Malachi says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. He picks up what has happened, right, that, that Elijah is going to be this one who's used by God to help turn the hearts of the people back again. Now Malachi, at the close of the Old Testament here, says, Behold, I am, this is the word of God being proclaimed through Malachi. God saying, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet. Now, is this, is this the other Elijah? No, he's, he's gone, right? I, was, I would say dead and gone, but, but, he, but he's not. He's just gone, right? God just took him to heaven, right? And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But he says, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And what's he going to do? He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. See the connection? Right? Malachi picks up this language and says, there's one coming in the spirit of Elijah who is going to bring restoration. Right? There's going to be a work in the heart. Right? God is going to do a work in the heart by this new Elijah who is going to come, and he is going to be used by God. 
Malachi also thinking about this says there's one in Malachi chapter 3. He says, behold, God says, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Right? He's going to come. Malachi 3 and Malachi 4, those, they're connected there. This one that who's coming, this one coming as, as like the prophet Elijah. He is going to prepare the way for who? Who is it Israel has been looking for since Deuteronomy chapter 34? The prophet, right? They don't know the name, but they know it's the prophet, right? There is one, there is a prophet, Moses said, that is coming like me, who is going to do a work among you. Malachi ends the Old Testament by saying, there's going to be one coming like Elijah, who is going to prepare the way for God to be able to do this transformative work where the hearts of of the fathers are turned back to their sons. It leaves us leaning in saying, when is that prophet going to come on the scene? When is this day of the Lord actually going to take place? Well, now we get to move into the New Testament, okay? And we get to go really fast because... um, there's a lot of ground to cover here really quickly. So some of this you're just going to have to go back and, and just kind of read back through and comb through yourself. All right? But we in the New Testament, we are meant to connect Elijah with what New Testament character? You've read ahead. All right. Yes, with John the Baptist. All four of the Gospels present John the Baptist as preparing the way for Jesus. Right, and they all pick up language from Isaiah chapter 40 that connect with Malachi chapter 4 and Malachi chapter 3. So all of scripture, right? It's all working together, right? And all the gospel writers want you to recognize that this, this one John the Baptist is coming, right? He's this, he's this type like, like Elijah. He's come to prepare the way for the one who is to come, right? We even get clues by their attire. John the Baptist and Elijah are described as wearing the same kind of attire, like camel hair, right? Looking like, looking like a bunch of hippies out there, right? Um, and then we see Jesus even identifies John the Baptist as the Elijah who was to come. And then we see in John's gospel, John the Baptist says, I must decrease in chapter 3, and he must, who's the he? Jesus is the he, right? So even John the Baptist recognizes, remember that the ministry of the second is going to exceed the ministry of the first. John recognizes that. He says, I've come to be like the Elijah. I've come to prepare the way, right? But the one that follows me, he's going to do something that, that I could never do. And we see that there, the, his ministry will exceed. And then John ends his gospel by saying, listen, The world couldn't even contain all the books that should be written to explain all of the things that Jesus did and all of the things that Jesus said, right? Even John's ending his gospel by reminding us, hey, the ministry of Jesus, which you guys have already guessed it, right? He is the prophet to come in (laughs) like Moses, right? But John's even saying, listen, what Jesus did exceeds the former, right? What happened before, what Jesus did It's far superior. It's far better. But even the priests and the Levites, right? The ones who, they weren't looking, right? They were blinded to who Jesus was. They rejected, they were going to reject this idea, right? They, They had a good thing going. But even they see John baptizing and preaching. They recognize his attire. And they even go to him and they go like, hey, come here. Are you Elijah? I mean, they get it, right? They, they know the scriptures. And so they see it, right? But we've already talked about this, so we're going to move on past this. The connection with the Jordan River, right? We've already talked about Elijah and Elijah, and that transition of power happened there at the Jordan River. Think about where John and Jesus met, John the Baptist and Jesus. Where, where do we see them coming together in the Gospels? Where? I th- you, think there's, you think there's purpose behind that? You think that's just an accident or a coincidence by God? He's like, you know, where should I have these two meet? Where should John be baptizing? <laughs> you know, the Sea of Galilee, maybe we ought to go up there. The Jordan River. There's significance to that, right? You've got, 
Moses, Moses and Joshua, right, with, with the waters, crossing the waters. And you've got Elijah and Elisha, right, at the Jordan River. And now you've got the one coming in the spirit of Elijah, seeing the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, meeting at the Jordan River, right? The prophets at the Jordan River were meant to see it. And then look at how Jesus is presented, right? We've already said there's one coming that we better listen to, coming like Moses. Think about what is said in Luke chapter 9, verse 35. Actually, I'm going to read it for you because this one's really good. I don't want you to miss this one here. Luke 9, 35. At Jesus' baptism. While he at his baptism, then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Do you see it? Do you see this thread from Deuteronomy? Where God says, there's going to be one coming. Moses says, you better get ready. There's one coming like me who's going to do the things that you saw me do, but he's going to do them far greater than I did them. Right? He's coming to deliver. He's coming to be the mediator. He's coming to be the high priest. He's coming to be the ruler who would reign. He's coming. You better listen to him. At the Jordan River, where all of these interactions have taken place, we see the voice of God speaking over Jesus' baptism there at the Jordan. God says, this is my chosen one. Listen to him. It's amazing how detailed Scripture is, how intentional it is for us to see what God is trying to, to show us here. But we see it even more. In John chapter 6, after Jesus has fed the 5,000, do you know what the people say? you know what they call Jesus? Not a prophet, the prophet. They call him the prophet. Peter and Stephen, we've been in the book of Acts, right? At Peter's sermon at Pentecost, and then at Stephen's sermon before he's stoned to death, they both recognize this. Same thing, right? They pick this up. They understand who Jesus was, that he was coming to be the fulfillment of what Moses had promised would happen, that there would be a prophet who would come, right? We see the continuation, just like we did with Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Elisha. We see Jesus, John the Baptist in Jesus. Look at what John preached in Matthew chapter 3, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. But look at what Jesus begins preaching when he, when he comes on, right? John says, I must decrease, he must increase. And so Jesus steps into his public ministry. What does he begin preaching? Same message, exact same message, right? But Elijah doesn't just point to John the Baptist. I want you to see how Elijah points to Jesus. Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead. Elijah raised a widow's son from the dead. Moses and Elijah we're at Mount Sinai. They have a very similar experience at Mount Sinai that we're meant to connect where they come in contact. They, come, they encounter God, right? They get hidden behind, you know, a rock, you know, and, and God passes by, right? They, they get to behold God's glory in a way that others had never done, right? So, so that happens. But then who is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. Did you ever think God just picked two random biblical characters that were kind of cool and just kind of threw them up there on the mountain like, like he's just sitting back and like, okay, I'm going to do something really cool here in the Gospels and Jesus is going to go up here and he's going to glow and Peter and James and John are really going to freak out about it and they're going to get it all wrong. But I need a couple of people to be up there just to make the story really good. Uh, who's not busy up here today? Uh, Moses, you and Elijah, you go. No, it's so intentional. It's so intentional. Here on the Mount of Transfiguration, you've got Moses who had led the Exodus out of Egypt, right? You've got Elijah who had been used by, by God to help deliver, to, to be part of delivering the people from the wickedness of worshiping Baal, right? On the Mount of Transfiguration, and Luke actually tells us what they were talking about up there. They were speaking about Jesus' departure or his exodus from this earth. What was going to, what caused his exodus from the earth? His what? His crucifixion, right? So you've got Moses delivering the people from bondage and slavery in Egypt. you got Elijah delivering them from, from the prophets of Baal. And now you have Jesus who he's speaking with them, talking about he's going to deliver them. 
the people, all, all those who would place their faith and trust in him from the bondage of sin and death. Isn't it amazing to see what scripture is doing for us here? Jesus, we're meant to see it. He's the fulfillment of, he's the ultimate fulfillment of Moses and Elijah. But then one other similarity between Elijah and Jesus, how was Elijah taken up to heaven? I've already said it a few times. Chariot of fire, right? In a a whirlwind, taken to heaven, right? One minute you see him, poof, next minute he's gone, right? How does Scripture record Jesus ascending to heaven after his resurrection and the time with his disciples? Riding in the clouds, very similar, like the pictures. You're meant to connect those pictures, right, to see that. But then Elijah points to Jesus, right? We're not, we aren't going to take time to these, but look at these different, in, in your own time, look at these different miracles of, that Elijah, Elisha performed. Sorry, I told you it would start to happen. Elisha would perform that Jesus also performed in the Gospels. We're meant to connect them as well. And then, just a little side, you'll have to go read this yourself. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11, we see this account of these two witnesses And the description of what the two witnesses are going to do, you're meant to see how they're coming in the spirit of Moses and Elisha, right? The things they do, the miracles they perform, the signs they perform, it's language out of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and it's language out of Exodus. You're going to be like, oh my goodness, like you'd be crazy not to connect what these two witnesses are doing. You're meant to look back and see, oh, it's kind of like Moses and Elijah here. But now, let's move on, because we want to use the little bit of time we have left here to look at Jesus. Why must Jesus be a prophet like Moses? Right? Because that's how we kind of started this out when we got to Moses, that there is coming a prophet like me. Why? Why is this important? Why is Scripture making us look to this idea that Jesus is the prophet that was to come, that Moses predicted, that Elijah and Elijah point to, all of this? Look at Hebrews chapter 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Help me out for a minute, okay, Why I take a drink of water. Why, and help me answer this question. Why must Jesus be viewed in this thread of being the prophet? Not a prophet, the prophet. Why is that an important way for us to see him and understand what he came to do? He's not just, somebody turn to John chapter 1, uh, verse 18. Somebody that can read well and read loudly, read verses 14 through 18 of John chapter 1. Thank you. So, verse 18. Look back in your Bibles with me for just a minute there. No one has seen God. No one has seen the Father. Right? So we don't know what He's like. Right? We've not seen Him. But what does John say? 
the only begotten of God who is in the bosom of the Father, right? He has explained him. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? Jesus didn't, he was not just a prophet delivering a message, a message from God. Jesus is God incarnate, who the word is made flesh to tabernacle, to dwell among us so that we would know what God is like, right? It's not just a message that God wants to communicate. What the message that he wants to communicate to the world is who he is. That's the message. God's saying, I want people to understand who I am. I want them to see this plan of redemption that I, that I have had since before the creation of the world. Right? But no one can see me. So the word has got to become flesh. Right? Emmanuel must come and be God with us. Jesus is the prophet because he didn't just come to speak a message from God. He was face to face with the Father. Remember that language of Moses, right? How he was a different kind of prophet. He didn't just get visions and dreams, but God spoke with him mouth to mouth, face to face. Idea? Jesus, eternity past, has been with the Father. And so when he stepped into time and in onto this earth, he came to deliver the message of who God is for us. He is the prophet to deliver this message. Jesus is the prophet that calls us to follow him from death to life, just as Israel had followed Moses through the Red Sea and was baptized in his name. And yet Jesus is greater than Moses because his salvation, he does more than point us to someone else. Jesus points us to himself, right? That, that's the beauty of this, right? Moses' ministry, right? The handoff to Joshua, Josh, you know, Elijah's ministry handed off to Elisha, right? John the Baptist comes on the scene. I must decrease, he must increase. And now we have Jesus. There's no one for Jesus to hand it off to because he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It all points to him, right? He is the final piece of this. We've seen this every time we've come together. With every thread we've looked at, how Jesus is the full and final picture that we are meant to see in order to understand what God is like. That's the beauty of this. This is the beauty of God's word, is to see it in this light. Right? Moses was a deliverer, right? Part of his role. But Jesus coming like Moses, but greater than Moses. Jesus has delivered us, not just from Egypt, but from all sin, right? He's delivered us from the bondage of sin and death, right? Moses served as a mediator between God and the Jewish people. Jesus has come in his flesh, right, through his death on the cross to be the ultimate mediator between God and man so that we could be reconciled to him, right? We no longer need any more sacrifices, right, because he was the ultimate sacrifice so we could know him. So he is the ultimate mediator. But Jesus, Moses served as a priest, Jesus is the ultimate high priest, right? He is the one <laughs> that brings us into a right relationship with God through his shed blood. It's through him that we have access to God. It's through the work of Jesus that we are justified and we are made right so that we can approach the throne of God, right? Jesus is our high priest. Moses led the people. He was the ruler. He served even almost kind of in a king-like role for the people in that season that God had him in leadership. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords, right? The first time he came, he came to be the suffering servant, to be that spotless lamb that would pay for all, to pay for our sin so that we could be right with God. But when he returns... He's coming as king of kings. He's coming as Lord of lords, right? When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And when he rose from that tomb, right, as we're getting ready to celebrate here in just less than two weeks, right? 
He sealed it, right? He wasn't just a prophet who was misunderstood and ended up dying because he got carried away and said a little too much and ticked off the wrong people. No, he wasn't a prophet, right? He was the prophet, the deliverer, the mediator, the high priest, the king of kings who willingly laid down his life to be a ransom for us. And then his resurrection from the grave proves that he is the prophet. He is the one that Moses said, there's coming one who will deliver you from your deepest need. And then Jesus says, his resurrection said, that is me. I am the one. I am that prophet that came to show you what God is like, to show you God's character, to show you God's heart, right? To show you everything that we need to know about God so that we could place our faith in him and fall before him and surrender and to live for him because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's, that's this thread that we're meant to see with the prophet. Isn't it good? Isn't it good to see the beauty of Scripture in this way? God didn't leave out any details, right? I love, I love the detail because it's meant to just show us so that it leaves us with no doubt that God really is who Scripture shows us He is, right? We don't need a prophet. We don't need someone to come with a new revelation for us. No one needs to come today saying, I have a new word from God, because Jesus is the final word from God, right? If there's anyone serving in a prophetic way today, it is just someone who will stand and preach this word that God has already given us, right? We need nothing else, right? So if you hear someone say, I'm a prophet with a new message, just go ahead and walk away or turn off the TV, or shut down that podcast, because they're wrong. We don't need another one, because we have the finished Word of God. Jesus is the prophet. Anyone who has what Scripture would say is fruit of the, you know, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, anyone who has a prophetic gifting today is one who just will declare the truth of God's Word in a timely way to a people who need to hear it. Because Jesus has accomplished everything. He's communicated everything we need to know about the Father. He's already done it. I've given you some little bonus material, all right? Because I knew we wouldn't have time to get there. Um, I want you to see how we see Jesus in the prophetic books of the major and minor prophets. So you've got a little thing. It's, it's devotional. It's inspirational. Read it. And just, I hope you're just in awe of how every book of the Bible points to Jesus. And then I've given you a little bit of reading that I would love for you to do. I found this blog post on a website called Desiring God. And it is how, basically it's telling you how to read the minor prophets. All right, those are tricky little books, right? And you get into them and you can get lost, you know, you can get wrapped around the axle, you can get lost in the weeds, whatever you want to, however you want to, you know, articulate that. It can happen in the minor prophets, like what in the world is going on in these books, right? I love the way the guy that wrote this, um, his name's Matthew Harmon. I love the way he wrote this. He says, listen, I want to show you how the minor prophets help you to enjoy Jesus. And so he writes this simple blog that helps you understand, hey, here's how I could read these and see Jesus in them. So take some time, right? Because we didn't even have time to get to chasing those threads of how, you know, we see Jesus in the book of Amos or in Obadiah or in Jonah or in Micah or in Isaiah. Right? We didn't even get to all that. This will just kind of whet your appetite maybe to do a little more study on your own. Okay? All right. How'd I do? Ha, got a minute to spare. We did it. All right. Let me pray us out of here, and we will be dismissed next week. All right. We talked a little bit about the Exodus, right? This, you know, when we teased it a little bit by looking at, at Moses and Joshua and then Jesus and this, this new Exodus that he accomplished in our salvation and deliverance from sin. Guess what? Next week, we get to unpack that thing in detail, because Pastor Jason is going to lead, uh, and I'll just be his sidekick, as we look at the thread 
of the Exodus, right, that runs all through, all through Scripture. So that's next week, okay? So be excited, be ready. Uh, I hope you guys have a great night, great uh, rest of your week. Uh, and I'll see you, see you later, okay? God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your faithfulness to, God, to your word, to your promises that you made. God, you promised that there would be a prophet coming in the spirit of Moses, like Moses, who would come to do what Moses could never do. God, thank you that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and that we could behold your glory, that you could show us what you're like. God, the, your magnificence, your beauty, your love, your grace, your mercy, your power could be on display in the person of Jesus, this prophet who would come, the prophet who would come to bring about our deliverance. So God, we marvel at your word, the love that you have to reveal yourself to us in the person of Jesus, to communicate the message we desperately need through Jesus Christ. God, help us to never tire of studying, of learning, and applying your word to our lives, to fall deeper in love with you, and God, to communicate your word to others to, so that they would know your magnificence and your saving power and your heart for them. So God, may your word continue to transform us and sanctify us and change us that we may walk looking more like Jesus in our everyday life. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great night. We'll see you later.